Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another installment of our video PowerPoint series for Unit 5, Cell Energistics. Today, what we're going to be talking about is photosynthesis. So with photosynthesis, we're going to talk about what goes through it, products, reactants, light reactions, dark reactions or light independent reactions, as well as, well, basically why it's needed. So without further ado, let's get this started. I will see you on the next slide. So the first question we have to answer here are what are autotrophs? Well, simply put, an autotroph is anything that can go ahead and make its own food. So autotrophs, that would be things like photosynthetic organisms, like plants and some types of algae, as well as chemosynthetic organisms, which use chemicals instead to make their energy, much like a lot of forms of bacteria. So why are they important? Well, think of it like this. Think of the food chain or the food, or the, uh, food web, right? So most things start off at the very bottom, which are the plants or the autotrophs. So without autotrophs, for example, if we didn't have plants, herbivores would have nothing to eat. So if we go ahead and remove the herbivores, they die off of starvation. Sure enough, the first level carnivores, then the secondary carnivores, and it just ex escalates from there. So long story short, they're the basis of the food chain. One big old circle of life. Now this does not mean, based off the picture, this is just an artist's rendition. This does not mean that trees eat dolphins. Dolphins eat monkeys. Monkeys eat lions. Lions eat eagles. Eagles eat antelope, which I guess that could kind of work. Uh, antelope eat octopi. Octopi eat butterflies. Butterflies eat tortoises. And tortoises eat entire trees. That's kind of not how it works. Anyway, let's keep going. So, energy for life. Autotrophs. Like we said before, autotrophs are organisms that can make their own food. We call these producers. And some examples include plants, like this tree here, and algae. The second type we need to talk about are called heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that depend on others for food. We call these consumers. And examples would be things like animals, bacteria, anything that has to consume others to get their energy. Now, okay, this does not mean, yes, I understand, you are probably very capable of going ahead and, well, going into the kitchen and making yourself some food. That does not make you an autotroph. Because that food, you're not directly, you know, you're not directly producing it from your body. You're not, like, uh, going out in the middle of the uh, field and looking up at the sun and being like, hmm... Okay, I'm full. We can't do that. So there are two biological processes that are needed to create usable energy for organisms. The first type is called photosynthesis. It's the process that converts sunlight into sugar. Now only autotrophs can do this. The second type is called respiration. It's a process that releases energy and sugar into usable energy for the cells. Now, both autotrophs and heterotrophs can go through this because respiration occurs in a specific organelle called the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, if you think back, is found in both plant and animal cells. So speaking of energy, we need to talk about something called ATP. ATP is an energy storage molecule, also known as adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine for the A, tri for the T, and phosphate for the P. So, real quick... The three components of an ATP molecule are adenine, a nitrogen base, ribose, a sugar, specifically a sugar with five carbons, and three phosphate groups, ATP. Now, I'd like you to go ahead and draw this. Please go ahead, take a little bit of time, pause it if you need to, and when you're finished, I'll see you on the next one. So ATP, continuing here, ATP is the universal currency for energy. ATP stores energy in the bonds between the phosphate groups. So if you recall back on that little diagram you just made, we have three phosphate groups, right? And there's a bond in between each one holding them together. When we break that bond, we go ahead and release energy. So when a bond is broken, energy is released. So ATP would go from adenosine triphosphate, we'd break one of the bonds, and we would get ADP, or adenosine diphosphate as well as a free-floating phosphate group now. Free-floating phosphate. Hmm. Try saying that three times fast. 
and we would also get an abundance of energy that was released when we broke the bond. So the structure of a chloroplast. So a chloroplast is the structure in a plant cell where photosynthesis occurs. Now, there is an internal structure here that we're going to go about in a bit of a different way. We're going to compare a chloroplast to breakfast, specifically a pancake. So, the first thing we need to talk about is the thylakoid, or the thylakoid membrane. It's the internal membrane. So these are going to look like tiny little pancakes, tiny little green pancakes, inside of the chloroplast. So, since we're comparing this to a pancake, the lumen is the space inside the thylakoid membrane. So what this would be is the light fluffy goodness inside of a pancake. The grana would be a stack of thylakoids. So the thylakoids are all put up in stacks, much like a stack of pancakes. Now the next time you want to go really confuse somebody, the next time you walk into an IHOP or a diner or wherever, go ahead and ask for a grana of pancakes. I guarantee you, they probably won't have any idea what you're talking about. Okay, maybe you don't want to do that. And finally, we have the stroma. The stroma is the solution that the thylakoids are embedded in. So, what do you go ahead and put on top of pancakes? Syrup. That's right. So the stroma would be like the syrup that you go ahead and cover the pancakes with. So, like we said before, here are the components of our chloroplast. If you take a look, we've got our thylakoids, which are down here, these small green little pancakes. We have the grana, or granum, which is the stack of thylakoids. We have the stroma, which is the solution that all of these thylakoids are embedded in, very similar to syrup. And it, it's not really on this diagram, but if you look inside the thylakoid, you would find the lumen, which is the fluffy goodness inside of our thylakoid. So, the more you know. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. I'm going to go ahead and take a little sip of tea here. Oh, yeah. That's the stuff. So, talking about uh, chlorophyll and chloroplasts, we need to talk about something called pigment. So, pigments are light absorbing molecules. Each pigment absorbs and reflects different wavelengths of light. Uh, wavelengths of light. And what we see is the reflected color. So the wavelengths vary between about 400 and a little over 700 for the wavelength in nanometers. So the shorter the wavelength, it's going to look very sporadic. Kind of up and down, the lengths are going to be really close to each other. These would be things like gamma rays, x-rays, and UV rays. Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, so towards the 700 or the red, this is where we have things like AM radio waves, shortwave radio, TV, FM, radar, and eventually moving into infrared. So these wavelengths are much more spaced out, and as such, they're a lot less dangerous to humans, and, well, other organisms. Think about, like, when you go ahead and take an x-ray, or you have an x-ray done. What do they always give you? So normally, they'll go ahead and give you a kind of lead apron that you wear and what that's supposed to do is help block out some of the radiation or keep some of the wavelengths from actually penetrating through your body and messing with your goodies so internal organs things like that you don't want those really messed up with radiation it's not a good time so pigment chlorophyll is the primary pigment of photosynthesis it's what gives plants their green color so the chlorophyll is found in the chloroplast now, plants actually do have other accessory pigments that absorb light that chlorophyll cannot. So think about it. If plants are green, you know, the primary pigment chlorophyll is green, what wavelength or color is it not absorbing and reflecting? Think about it for a sec. If you said green, you'd be correct. Remember, whatever color we see is the color that is not absorbed, but rather reflected. So keratinoids, these are accessory pigments, like we said, that help plants absorb light that chlorophyll cannot. So these are more yellow, orange, and brown in color. Now we'll be talking about this in a second, so just let that sit for a sec. So pigment. 
The sun gives off a kind of whitish light, which is a mixture of all the colors in the spectrum. And whatever color is not absorbed and reflected, in this case green, that's the color we see. So think about it like on a hot summer day. On a hot summer day, what type of shirt do you want to wear? Do you want to wear a light shirt or a dark shirt? Well, if you wear a light shirt, what that's going to do is it's white. So it's a mixture of all the colors. So what's actually happening here is that shirt is reflecting off more or less every wavelength of light. So it's not absorbing the heat. Meanwhile, if you wear a dark colored shirt outside, that's going to be absorbing most of the colors or most of the UV rays increasing the heat of your body much more quickly. So photosynthesis, we need three things for photosynthesis to occur. We need sunlight, carbon dioxide, and we also need water. Now, once this process takes place inside of the plant, specifically inside of the chloroplast, it creates things like glucose and oxygen. So, the uh, equation here for photosynthesis can be summarized as six molecules of CO2 plus six molecules of H2O plus sunlight will give us C6H12O6, which is also known as glucose, and it will also give us six molecules of oxygen. Now this, <laughs> oh boy, this is something unique. The photosynthesis song. If you go ahead and click on that link, well, you're in for a treat. Or maybe not. But, either way you look at it, it's definitely something you won't forget. So why don't you go ahead, take a look at that, and I'll see you as soon as you're finished. Take your time. I can wait. Oh, hey. Welcome back. Pretty crazy video, right? The frog, man. I just don't... How does it move like that? Well, anyway, whatever. Not important. So now we need to discuss a few scientists that helped with the kind of discovery of photosynthesis and also gave us more information on plants. The first is a gentleman by the name of Van Helmont. So Van Helmont did an experiment where he measured the plant mass, so the weight of the plant, and the weight of the soil that he put it in, or the mass of the soil, before and after five years of growth. And he discovered that most of the mass gain came from the water. So at the beginning, if you look down here, he had a five pound willow sapling and 200 pounds of dirt. Went ahead, weighed them out, put them in a pot. And then he went ahead and took care of this plant for five years, which in my opinion is pretty impressive. I, I gotta admit, I don't have a green thumb, man. I can't do that. But anyway, so after five years, he went ahead and weighed and took the mass of the plant, the willow and the dirt once more. So this time, the willow went from 5 pounds to about 169 pounds and 3 ounces. So it actually had a 3,400% increase in mass, or weight. Meanwhile, the dirt weighed 199 pounds and 14 ounces. So it actually had a 0.00063% decrease in weight. So what this showed was that the soil, while necessary, is not responsible for feeding the plant. Where most of the mass actually comes from is the water, and if you think about the structure of a plant cell, this makes a lot of sense. Because what's that organelle called that's inside the plant cell? Uh, it's pretty big, holds water. The vacuole. So the vacuole absorbs the water, and that's where most of the weight or mass of the plant comes from. The next scientist we're going to talk about is <laughs> Priestley. Sorry, that that dude gets me every time, man. Looks like he just ate something really sour. Whew. All right. Anyway, his experiment here was he placed a candle in a jar. So he lit the candle and put the jar over top of it. And sure enough, the candle would eventually die out. Why? Because it burned up all the oxygen inside the jar. So we know that plants, or not plants, sorry, we know that candles, or fire specifically, needs oxygen to burn. So what he did next was he put a tiny piece of mint and the candle in the same jar. He went ahead, lit the candle, put the jar over top, and sure enough, he found that the candle burned for a longer period of time. 
So since he knew that flames need oxygen to burn, he concluded that plants must produce oxygen. And here's the setup. So what we have is he had his candle right here. He had a hose going ahead connecting it. And here is where we had the plant, or the mint. So the mint would go ahead, produce oxygen, give it to the flame to burn, and sure enough, it lasted for a longer period of time. So the next scientist we're going to discuss here is a man by the name of Ingenhaus. Kind of looks like a bit heavier set version of uh, Thomas Jefferson. So what he did was he did the same experiment that Priestley did, except this time he did two different variants. One in light and one in dark, or absence of light. And what he found was that plants only go ahead and produce oxygen in the presence of light. So, plants need light to produce oxygen, which is kind of important considering, you know, that's what we breathe. So photosynthesis, there are two stages to photosynthesis. We have the light dependent reactions, also known as the light reactions, and we have the light independent or the dark reactions, day and night. All right, so what we're gonna be doing next is going through the steps of photosynthesis. So if you wanna take a break, go ahead, pause the video, and I'll be right here when you come on back. Or, you know, just burn right through it because, you know, you're a champ. Either way. So the first step here are the light dependent reactions. So the light dependent reactions occur inside the thylakoid membranes. So remember, the thylakoid was the pancake. So light dependent light reactions occur inside the light fluffy goodness of the thylakoids. So step number one. Light is absorbed by the chlorophyll in photosystem 2, and electrons are excited. So the light energy actually causes electrons to get a bit more energy. And when they do, they become excited. They move around a lot more. Step number two, the excited electrons move through a series of reactions called the electron transport chain. So by going ahead and getting that extra energy, this allows the electrons to go through a set of reactions that will eventually lead us to something pretty important which we'll talk about next. So if you go ahead and take a look down here, you'll actually see how this all works. So the light enters the thylakoid membrane, excites the electrons, and goes ahead and actually starts to uh, go through the electron transport chain. And also, if you look closely, you'll see what's happening to the water. The water is actually split, and this splitting of water actually causes the energy to be released, making the electrons excited. So step number three, the light energy splits water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. So the oxygen is released into the atmosphere, and the hydrogen bonds to a carrier molecule called NADPH. That is then used up during the dark reactions. And also remember, anytime we split a molecule or we break a bond, we create ATP or energy. So splitting the water also creates ATP. So the light dependent reactions are a five set of steps. Now this is the kind of simplified version. Uh, we could go way more in depth with this, but we're deciding not to for now. Uh, if you take any of the AP level courses, I'm sure it'll go much more in depth than what we're covering here. But for now, this is what you're responsible for knowing. So the light reaction, simply put, we have sunlight and water going in to our chloroplast into the light dependent reactions which occur inside of the tiny green pancakes thylakoids what we get out of it are the energy carriers NADPH ATP and also oxygen is released so like we said before sunlight is needed for oxygen to be created or released from the plant so our next step here is we're going to be going through the light independent or dark reactions so the end products of the light reactions are NADPH, ATP, both of which are used up in the next set, and oxygen. So the light independent reactions. Well, they're independent of light, so they don't require light to occur. They're also called the dark reactions, or the Calvin cycle. Named after this man right here, well, right here, Melvin Calvin. Yep, 
Guy's got two first names. Melvin Calvin. Seems like a pretty stand-up guy, if you ask me. Anyway, so what we're going to be going through next are the steps of the light independent or the dark reactions. Let's get into it. These occur inside the stroma. So if you remember the stroma, this is the dark viscous syrup or aqueous solution that surrounds our thylakoids. So the light independent reactions. CO2, carbon dioxide, enters the plant and attaches itself to a sugar molecule that will eventually become glucose. This process is called carbon fixation. Carbon dioxide, NADPH, and ATP combine with enzymes to make our glucose, which is C6H12O6, and it also creates more CO2. So since we're creating bonds, we need the energy from ATP. So we're going to break the bonds between our ATP to release that energy. Also, one of the hydrogens from NADPH is going to go combine with that sugar molecule to make our glucose. So simply put, during the light independent reaction, CO2 enters along with ATP and NADPH. The CO2 attaches to a simple sugar molecule via carbon fixation. And also we use the energy from ATP and the hydrogen from NADPH to create glucose. Now, once this is all said and done, we get NADP+, plus, see we lost the hydrogen there, and ADP plus a phosphate. So we split the ATP, we broke the bond, to get ADP plus a phosphate, which is then recycled again during the light dependent. So basically, one cycle helps out the other. And this occurs inside the aqueous solution of the stroma. So factors that can affect photosynthesis. Light intensity. The more light the plants have, the faster the rate of photosynthesis. Which makes sense. The more energy they have available, the quicker the reaction is going to occur. Also, CO2 concentration. The more CO2, the faster the rate of photosynthesis. So, there was an old tale that if you went ahead and talked to your plants, they would grow faster. And that's actually kind of true. Because, think about it, every time we speak, every time we exhale... What gas is coming out of your face? CO2. And the plants can use that. So there actually is some validity to talking to your plants. I mean, you might look a little foolish doing it, but hey, if it's going to help out the plants, go for it. And also temperature. The rate of photosynthesis will slow down at extreme temperatures of hot or cold. So if it's too hot, the plant isn't going to want to go through photosynthesis. It's going to want to conserve its water. And the same thing in the cold. It's going to want to conserve its water so it doesn't freeze the whole way through. And also, there are other factors such as, um, you know, soil, water. If it doesn't have soil, it doesn't have water, it's not going to go through. But these are the big three. So, with that, that brings us to a close for today. That brings us to the end of photosynthesis. So if you think back, what we talked about were what photosynthesis is, the reactants it needs, so what goes into it, the products, what's created, and we also discussed the scientists behind the creation of it, such as Ingenhaus, Priestley, Calvin, and Van Helmont, and we also discussed the light-independent and light-dependent reactions, and how they go ahead and kind of act like a cycle to keep the plant going. Uh, we also talked about pigments, which, you know, pigments, light-absorbing molecules. So, in short, you thought I was going to come back to this, but in short, if you think back, what happens during the fall? I'm going somewhere with this, hang on. So, during the fall, it gets colder. There's less sunlight. So, what happens to the leaves? If you notice, the chlorophyll, what makes the, the uh, leaves green, slowly starts to die off. It's not getting enough light. So there, the accessory pigments, the carotenoids, go ahead and take over. This is what causes the leaves to go from green to yellow, brown, orange, red, etc. See? Always coming back to that. Well, anyway, I'm not going to take up any more of your time here. Thank you very much for joining us today. And until next time, I will see you in the next video. You all keep it classy.
Take care.